In section 8.4, we'll look at a special type of graph. If a graph has certain characteristics, it's an example of what's called a tree. So every tree is a graph, but some graphs are not trees. So within the set of graphs, there's a few that fit this description of a tree. And a tree is actually very intuitive because we think about things like a family tree. Notice we can draw a graph like this for a family tree or you can think about a physical tree with branches. And the defining feature of a tree, we speak about trees within the context of graphs, a family tree or a tree like this, is this kind of branching process where once you branch out from a point, you don't loop back to it. So if you think about branches going out, branches don't connect back to the root except through the branch itself. So a branch doesn't go out from the root and then loop back and connect again. Same thing with a family tree. As a family tree extends out from one node, there's not a loop back to that through any other points. So the definition of a tree <clears throat> is a <clears throat> tree with no simple circuits. So in other words, if you want to start at this point and travel out somewhere and then come back to it, you'd have to travel back along the route you already took. There's no way to loop back around another way. So that's the short definition of a, a tree. It's a connected graph with no simple circuits. There's a couple equivalent ways of defining a graph. If you can find a unique simple path between any two nodes, that's not particularly helpful for identifying them, but it's true. This idea of being connected but barely connected is a helpful one. Again, if you cut the graph anywhere, it would make it completely disconnected. Just like a tree, if you cut a branch, that branch falls off. It's not connected elsewhere. Another way to do it is to think about a graph that's connected that has one fewer edge than the number of nodes. So you can count how many nodes there are, count how many edges there are, and if there's one fewer edge, then it's a tree. So there's an example of finding uh, which graph is a tree, or whether a graph is a tree or not, you can go through and, and test those. But once you get used to it, you can pretty easily spot a tree uh, as opposed to a, a type of graph that isn't a tree. Then we'll see two applications of this. One is called a binary search tree. And this is a, an application that uh, computer science students would see a lot. Basically, it, it relates to searching through a list. And again, Think about how often you, you use search. If you um, want to find anything, there's you know, Google searches or um, searching through files on your phone. Um, we use searching all the time, and so we need it to be really efficient. But it's a hard thing to just take a random list and search through it. If that information gets sorted somehow, it <clears throat> makes the search a lot more efficient, makes it easier to find things. It turns out that sorting is also hard. So a binary search tree basically provides a way to quickly <clears throat> sort and search through things. And when we say quickly, we mean for a computer. This is, is sort of optimized for how a computer handles searching and sorting. So a binary search tree is a really powerful and really commonly used tool um, in the world of, of searching and sorting. So a <clears throat> binary tree means a tree that has, at each step, up to two branches. So if you look at a tree like this, this is called a binary tree because at each node, as it branches out from there, there are potentially two branches, but no more. So Leah, for instance, has two branches. Callista has two branches. Adrian doesn't have any. Jason has one, but none of them have more than two branches coming out from them. So a binary tree has this form like this, as opposed to this family tree up here, where this branch, for instance, branches off into three segments. So that would not be a binary tree. But this one is. It's a binary tree because binary two, there's at most two uh, children for each parent. And again, as you're thinking about trees, the terminology is helpful to think back to a family tree. And you can think about parents and children, descendants and ancestors, 
siblings, all this terminology gets used in trees because it's, it's fairly intuitive. So the idea here is that this tree is sorted where this node here, everything to the left of it, everything as you travel down the left branch, comes before it alphabetically. So all of these names come before Leah alphabetically. All of these names come after it. And that's true for every node here. If you look at Priya, everything to the left, every child to the left of that, every descendant to the left of that comes before it alphabetically. And every descendant to the right comes after it alphabetically. And so there's this natural sorting. So if you want to search for a name here, you start at the top and you'd compare and say, is my name before Leah or after? And that tells me which direction to travel. And then continue doing that until you find the one you're looking for. So you can very quickly find um, the item you're searching for in a long list. So here's an example of building a binary search tree. You should go through carefully and, and read this example. But basically, you start with the first word, and then that becomes your top node, sometimes called the root. And then from that, you start adding pieces to the right or to the left, depending on whether they come before or after it, <clears throat> alphabetically. So the second word comes after it, you would put it down and to the right. And then the following word comes after it as well. So you go down to the right and then compare it to this word. It comes before it, so you go down to the left and there's an empty spot to place it. So you place that one there. And then you can repeat that until you get this full tree, this binary search tree. So you can practice with that example and with this uh, one as well, uh, building a binary search tree. And then once you have one built, you can search through it very efficiently uh, by comparing, starting with the first node and then traveling down to whatever word you're looking for. So again, you can go through that example and see how that searching process works and how many comparisons you need to make that happen. The second application of trees are called spanning trees. So if we take a graph, a general graph like this one, this example has a network of roads connecting different houses or different intersections, and if we want to use our resources as efficiently as possible, if we want to plow just the minimum number of roads to get this so that no one is isolated, so no one is totally cut off, everyone has a route out of their house, for instance, we can build what's called a spanning tree, because we don't need to plow all these roads in order to make a connected graph. Basically, what we can think about is start with this graph and start deleting ones that we don't need. So if we start deleting sort of redundant roads, we end up with this spanning tree. And if these roads got plowed, then everyone could get everywhere else. So F could get to D, for instance. Maybe not as efficiently as before, but they can still get there. And so you can save and make more efficient um, processes like this. So a spanning tree is if you take a graph and you basically delete edges until you get a tree. So remember, a tree is sort of the uh, fewest edges that you can have to still keep it connected. So if it's a graph that's connected and has redundancies, you can just start deleting them. So, of course, if you take this graph, there are many different spanning trees you could get for the same graph. There's not only one answer. So when you have connections like this, roads, or if you're building a communication network and you want to lay cable as, as efficiently as possible, you would design something like this. Um, and again, as it mentions here, every time you use the internet, when you connect to a server, your connection is going through a number of routers and switches, which are all basically, um, in short, small computers that are taking your information and transferring it along. Um, and every time you do that, the uh, routers use a spanning tree to figure out how to get you from point A to point B as efficiently as possible. So that when you make a request to google.com, it will pick the route and the server and the set of routers and switches that will get you your, your information as quickly as possible, uh, the most efficiently. So it's, it's a very valuable uh, tool to have. If you have a weighted graph, then there's a way to pick a spanning tree that's the most efficient. 
um, any spanning tree, you can just start deleting edges until you can't delete any more without disconnecting it. But if you have weighted graphs and you want to carefully pick the spanning tree that lends itself to efficient connections, so you want to have lowest weights possible on your spanning tree, then it's a little bit more interesting. We have an algorithm for this as well, just like we had algorithms earlier. This is called Kruskal's algorithm, and it's a pretty easy one, a pretty simple one. Basically, you start with the edge with the lowest weight, you add that one, and then you just keep going from there. Add the ones with the closest, with the lowest weights um, that you can, as long as it doesn't form a loop, as long as it doesn't form a circuit, uh, because doing that would make it be more than a tree. So you keep doing that until you have a spanning tree. All the all the nodes are connected. So you can follow this example and see it's very simple to do this. And then there's another example um, with a, a slightly bigger graph of building a spanning tree. Very simple um, algorithm to follow. Nothing super complicated. But those are the two applications of trees: binary search trees and uh, the minimal spanning trees, or spanning trees in general. There are many more applications of trees, but those are the two that we see in this section, and that's enough uh, for us to get a little flavor of, of what these are used for.